again. Welcome to our webinar series, Spotlight on Structured Literacy. Uh, my name is Kim Day, and I'm a member of the IDA Georgia Board of Directors. We're joined this evening by Elizabeth Hogan, who is the president of the Reading League Georgia. And on behalf of the boards of both IDA and uh, the Reading League Georgia, we're pleased to be offering this series. Uh, this marks IDA and uh, the Reading League's third year working in collaboration to provide webinars focused on structured literacy and the science of reading and writing. IDA and the Reading League are committed to providing information on evidence-based practices to educators, parents, and advocates. In doing so, we hope all students will have access to structured literacy instruction. In this four-part series, our speakers will discuss how to most effectively instruct literacy based on the science of instruction and what content to include to ensure that students become competent readers and writers. This evening's presentation focuses specifically on Georgia's literacy legislation and policy initiatives to support structured literacy for all Georgia's children. Tonight's speakers, Dr. Jennifer Lindstrom, Amy Denty, and Joy Hawkins, will talk with us about Senate Bill 211, which established the Georgia Council on Literacy, House Bill 538, the Georgia Early Literacy Act, and Senate Bill 48, Georgia's Dyslexia Law. Before we begin, I want to thank you uh, to those who have submitted questions when you registered for the web webinar. But as a reminder, if you have other questions, please put them in the chat box. The chat will be monitored and our speakers will address as many of your questions as they're able to during the Q&A. And now it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Um, Dr. Jennifer Lindstrom joined the teaching and learning team at the Georgia Department of Education, or Godot, in September of 2021 as a statewide literacy coordinator to assist our state as we lift awareness of dyslexia and create stronger evidence-based supports for students who are experiencing difficulties while learning to read and write. Dr. Lindstrom continues to serve as an associate professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders uh, and Special Education at UGA, and is also a member of the International Dyslexia Association's uh, Board of Directors at both the state and national levels. Also joining us is Amy Denty, the Director of Literacy for the Georgia Department of Education. She leads the, co the coordinated literacy efforts of the department, including Godot's responsibilities under the Georgia Early Literacy Act. Prior to her present position, uh, Ms. Dendy served as instructional specialist for Godot's Office of Rural Education and Innovation, where she facilitated literacy support contracts with RISAs across the state of Georgia to provide access to literacy professional learning for educators. She also served on the committee to develop Georgia's uh, new e ELA standards and served on the Dyslexia Task Force. Welcome, Ms. Dendy. And then also Joy Hawkins joins us. She earned her Juris Doctorate degree from Georgia State College of Law. She began her career in state government uh, in the Senate Research Office. She worked under Governor Purdue's administration as a poly policy analyst and deputy chief operating officer. Ms. Hawkins served as the education director for the Metro Atlanta Chamber, director of grants and scholarships for Georgia Student Finance Commission. After leaving the commission, Ms. Hawkins led a literacy movement serving as director of Literacy for All. And in 2019, Dr. Or, I don't know if he's doctor or not, Governor Kemp um, appointed Ms. Hawkins as the executive director of the Governor's Access to Student Achievement. So please welcome Dr. Jennifer Lindstrom, Amy Denty, and Joy Hawkins. Thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's all yours, uh, Dr. Lindstrom. Okay, let me pull up our presentation, minimize here. And good evening, everyone. It's such um, a delight to, to be with you all this evening. So thank you for joining us. There we go. Um, so as you know, we will be um, covering tonight the aligning state literacy policies and practices. Um, so all of the efforts and initiatives in our state related to literacy and dyslexia. And we'll be connecting the Georgia Council on Literacy, which is uh, uh, Senate Bill 211, the Georgia Early Literacy Act, HB 538, and Georgia's dyslexia efforts, which is uh, SB 48. So we're going to begin by hearing from Joy Hawkins, um, representing the Georgia Council on Literacy, and then we'll hear from Amy Denty, and then I will um, 
follow Amy and talk about dyslexia efforts. So I will um, pass the baton on to Joy. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and welcome, everyone. It was delightful to see how many states are represented in the audience today. Um, and, you know, Georgia, like Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Mississippi, has just recently in 2023 joined the group of states with almost identical legislation on structured uh, literacy and the science of reading. And so um, that bill, House Bill 538, has five distinct requirements. And Amy Denty will go into those requirements in a lot more detail, but I'm telling you that now because um, one thing that I think Georgia really kind of set apart from other states is that we have a literacy council and that council has responsibilities for really kind of shepherding and monitoring the success and the implementation efforts of House Bill 538 and the various agencies that lead those efforts. So this is just a very simple structure that I wanted to show, I think a visual sometimes better. Um, Georgia has um, what it was called Called the Alliance of Education Agency Heads. And in 29 and 2009, 2010, it was, uh, you know, we believe it was the alliance that kind of pushed us into the race of the top finalists. Um, that alliance has kind of ebbed and flowed over the years, but it's back. And so at the very top is the Georgia Council. Um, and then the agency heads report up to the council and each of the working groups is led by one of the agency heads in our education system. So um, our early learning, our Godot, Georgia Department of Education, um, our Professional Standards Commission and University System of Georgia. And then we have a Technical College System of Georgia. And so I've said those in the, in the order of those boxes. And then from that, there are some other supporting groups um, that will feed into those uh, four areas as time goes on. So next slide. Senate Bill 211 envisioned, um, like I said, a, 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 a very diverse council uh, from folks all over the state. And so there are 30 members appointed by the governor, the lieutenant governor and the speaker. And they were very cautious to say, you know, if you're not showing progress, we're sunsetting in 1231-26. And, and that really gives us a nudge to, you know, hit the ground running. And, um, and we hope that we're going to show a trajectory change even in this first year. By the way, the council was only um, set up and authorized and went into practice in July of 2023. Um, and then the Alliance of Agency Heads, as I mentioned, they are also um, required to support the literacy efforts of the council. Next slide, please. So um, the responsibilities of the council, um, as opposed to other agencies, are as follows. Um, there's very... Uh, distinct language in the bill to look after and pay attention to those minority English language learners and those uh, students with dyslexia. Um, and as a side note there, some of the other states have th that have had legislation implemented on the science of reading, um, you know, later went into dyslexia. In Georgia, we handled dyslexia first. We had that started with screeners, a task force, et cetera. And that's what Jennifer will talk more about in a few moments. Um, we also are required to monitor the literacy goals and metrics and provide, um, and the DOE is supposed to provide an annual report um, by October 31st. And then the council will review our education funding formula and suggest changes or um, edits or um, additions to that formula. Um, and then in addition to those things described here, um, the, the law is very clear. They want us to look at other states and other states' best practices. And I, I know Amy Denty spends a lot of time talking to Mississippi, talking to our neighboring states, as do we. Um, and, and the council members. And so at our last um, 
in-person council me meeting, uh, Carrie Wright from Mississippi, he was the superintendent there. During the 10 years of the um, beginning of the movement till they were really making strong progress, presented and gave us tips on how to use the Mississippi playbook here in Georgia. Um, and so in addition to that, we are tasked with um, looking at um, looking at uh, the science of reading and structured um, literacy and, and the implementation of all of those five requirements of House Bill 538. So next slide, please. And so before I pass the baton to Amy, um, I'm, I'm just going to, going to give me give you my personal um, it, it just thrill that Georgia has now in, um, embraced the structured literacy, and we know it works. We've seen other states, and it is a paradigm shift for a lot of our um, local systems. And there are 180 systems in Georgia. So um, Amy is on the ground working with those um, districts every day. She can talk more about that. And if you have questions about the implementation and some of the early things that we're seeing from districts, please um, share those with us at the end. Amy? Um, real quick, I did want to comment. Thank you, Joy. That was very helpful. Um, several of the questions that were submitted were related to the reporting requirements. So that is, again, just to reiterate what Joy said, one of the many responsibilities of the council is to review um, the data that are submitted and, and you know, provide re reports um, up until that, that um, 2026 uh, sunset date. But um, so it's ongoing, but we'll both, Amy and I will both talk more about those requirements of what districts do have to report. But I think there were several questions about accountability. So that's part of the, the council's role. Okay, I will. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Joy. I'm thrilled to be here tonight to talk with y'all about all the great work that's going, going on in Georgia around literacy, structured literacy and the science of reading. I really feel like the stars have aligned. We have our Georgia Council on Literacy. We've had Senate Bill 48, our dyslexia legislation for some time now. The Georgia Early Literacy Act is here. And I don't want to forget all of the things that are that were already happening in districts. Districts were already seeing the need to um, shift and to make some important shifts. And so I think that we're at a special place in Georgia right now where all of the stars are aligning so that we can make great things happen for children and for teachers in our schools. So I'm going to talk about the Georgia Early Literacy Act, which was House Bill 538. And there are five components of House Bill 538. High quality instructional materials, universal screeners, targeted interventions, professional learning, and teacher preparation. And the only reason that teacher preparation doesn't have a star is because that's the component that does not reside in the Georgia Department of Education. Joy mentioned that the Georgia Professional Standards Commission is um, really responsible for ensuring that that teacher preparation happens. But of course, our colleges and the University System of Georgia are closely related to that work. And so I'm going to concentrate on those top four components because those are the components that reside um, under the purview of the Georgia Department of Education. So we'll start out with, um, well, let me tell you first about this really important document. So the Aligning State Literacy Policies and Practices document is a great document where you can find just about everything that's happening at the Georgia Department of Education that is related to literacy. This document is updated regularly. It was updated yesterday. And so if you have a paper copy, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your paper copy says January 16th on the front. Um, and so we try to keep everyone updated through this document. Page two will always tell what the newest updates are and have a little summary. And so this is a great document to keep your eyes on. Next slide, please, Jennifer. 
All right, let's talk for a moment about high quality instructional materials and what's required in the law. So the House, um, House Bill 538 required that the State Board of Education approve core high quality instructional materials for K-3 reading. And they approved the first list on November 2nd, 2023. By next December or December 2024, local boards of education have to approve the materials that they're using in their local districts. And then by the 15th, each local board of education will have to certify to the DOE that its instructional materials are indeed high quality. Um, Jennifer, if you'll go to the next slide. So this is the list of the eight core um, instructional resources that were approved on November 2nd. We are in the process right now of another request for information and receiving applications. We know that many local school districts plan to use some remaining ESSER dollars to purchase um, instructional materials. And so we wanted to make sure that we had another review rather quickly as a service to districts so that they will be able to have all of the information they need to make those important budgeting, budgeting decisions. You can see that these um, materials are divided into the characteristics that we looked at with our rubric. Um, the green dots indicate that the component was evident, yellow is partially evident, and red, not evident. Um, I will say that we had a fabulous committee of a, um, to vet these materials. We contracted with the Georgia Language Arts Supervisors Association, and each state board member recommended a member. We asked the state board members to recommend members with deep knowledge of early literacy, the science of reading, structured literacy. Um, GOSA appointed two members and um, we also had, I served as an ex officio member and um, the Georgia literacy coach also served as an ex officio member. Um, so we had a great group of educators who were really invested in the process and took their role seriously. It, it is one of the best professional experiences I've ever had, just seeing the passion and commitment that the people worked with to ensure that we did indeed have a list of high quality instructional materials. Jennifer, could you go to the next slide, please? So you notice that I kept saying that these were core materials. The State Board of Education will not have a vetting process for supplemental materials. And many districts do use some supplemental materials. And we do want to ensure that those supplemental materials are of high quality. That is what our students and our teachers deserve. And so we have released some guidance and a rubric that districts can use to vet their supplemental materials. And, and even though this goes a little bit beyond the law, we will we are asking districts to make sure that they vet their supplemental materials using a quality rubric so that we can ensure not only that we're meeting the letter of the law, but that we're meeting the spirit of the law as well. And so this document is our rubric and it has some guidance for using the rubric. All right, now I think that we're going to move to universal screeners and targeted interventions. That's the, those are the next two um, buckets in House Bill 538. And so the law requires that DOE publish a list of approved screeners, including and also provide a free screener. And so the list of approved screeners was published on July 19th and a free screener through our assessment partners at DRC Beacon is anticipated in August of 2024. We're really excited about the possibilities of that free screener. Dr. Lindstrom and I serve on a, a committee that works closely with the, our partners at DRC to develop that. And we're ensuring that the screener that is developed 
will meet all of the requirements for Senate Bill 48 and all of the requirements for House Bill 538. And so we're excited about the results of that and DRC is making some great progress. The law requires that beginning August 1st, 2024, that all local school systems administer universal screeners three times a year to every student in grades K through three with the first administration occurring within 30 days of the beginning of school. Um, there are some that the one of the screeners can be the dyslexia screener. Um, one of the screeners could also be the formative assessment that is available for students in grades K through three as well. Um, so screening, of course, is very closely tied to targeted interventions. And so when a screener waves a red flag that there may be a problem with a student, we certainly hope that districts will then do some follow-up diagnostic screening to really pinpoint areas of need for the students. Our law requires that local um, education agencies implement a tiered reading intervention plan for any K through three student who exhibits a significant reading deficiency on a screener within 30 days of the student being identified. LEAs can, of course, use their existing MTSS frameworks and processes for this. We have a couple of um, documents that help with that. These help with both the literacy requirements and our dyslexia requirements. We have the reading and dyslexia screening process flowchart and also the characteristics of dyslexia rubric. We're also working on some templates and some guides for those tiered reading intervention plans. And we hope to have something to share with you on that front in the next couple of months. Okay, Jennifer, now we're gonna talk about professional learning. Um, the Georgia Early Literacy Act requires that all local education agencies ensure that all K-3 teachers complete a state-approved literacy training program. Georgia has a free offering, which is the Georgia Literacy Academy. This is our partnership with the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy. It consists of 10 modules, all devoted to learning more about structured literacy. The courses are asynchronous and they're set up so that they can easily be blended into professional learning, learning um, communities in local districts. And they're just really excellent. Um, I was really thrilled today to check the numbers. Right now in the Georgia Literacy Academy, we've already had 2,700 teachers enroll in the first module and 1,440 have completed their badge for that module. We have 1,420 who have enrolled in the second module with 1,007 completing their badge for that. And I just think that those numbers speak to the excitement of our teachers and leaders throughout the state. And so we're really excited about that. And the partnership with the Rollins Center has been just fabulous. A second option besides the Georgia Literacy Academy is that teachers can complete any of the independent programs accredited by the International Dyslexia Association. That list is long and there are so many good options there. And I know that many of our districts are taking advantage of some of those excellent programs. Another way that teachers can um, complete a state approved training program is to earn their um, Georgia Professional Standards Commission reading or dyslexia endorsement. So there are many ways to achieve that requirement there. Um, the Law also requires that local education agencies provide instructional support for K through three teachers. And they go on to, it goes on to describe that support as on site teacher training, demonstrated lessons, and prompt feedback on improving instruction. Many of you may have heard of the tiered coaching model that is being proposed this year. 
And that tiered coaching model would really go a long ways to be able to address this part of the professional learning portion of the Early Literacy Act. Okay, Jennifer. Oh, these are the um, these are the ten modules that are available in the Georgia um, Literacy Academy, and you can see the approximate time that it takes to complete those modules. But the modules are so easy to access and easy to work into a realistic time frame. So oral language is a four hour module, but that doesn't mean you're going to sit for four hours and work. The, the lessons are divided into very small and manageable chunks, which I think really help serve to ensure that school leaders, teacher leaders can take those small chunks, can talk about those in professional learning communities and can really talk about ways to implement that learning in a deep and meaningful way into the classroom. We know that we can't just sit and receive the learning. We've also got to put it into action. And that is often one of the hardest parts of professional learning. And so we're excited about some of our other partnerships with the Rollins Center, our knowledge building for leaders and our navigation cohorts that are really helping to support leaders in ensuring that this important professional learning is actually implemented into the classroom where children can reap the most benefits. All right, let's see. So this little guide that we've developed is a course guide to the Georgia Literacy Academy. It just helps teachers know exactly how to access those courses and gives some information about um, access and how to keep up with what all they've completed and those sorts of things. Teachers who take the courses through Georgia Learns, um, there it becomes very portable. That record of their badges travels with them to any school district that they may go to within the state of Georgia. Teachers can also choose to engage in the Georgia Literacy Academy through Rollin, the Rollins Center Cox campus where they will also achieve certificates that they can keep up with that are also very portable. And just a few pieces of related work. We talked about the Universal Screeners, our partners at the Sandra Dunnigan Deal Center for Early Language and Literacy completed a psychometric review of the Universal Screeners approved by the Department of Education. And we really encourage our districts to take a look at that review when they're choosing their screeners. There's a lot of great information in there. And I just can't say enough about um, the work that the Deal Center is doing and the, the fact that they have been such good partners to us in this work. And so please be sure that you take a look at that um, psychometric review. Um, I've mentioned some of these things that are happening with professional learning. I mentioned the knowledge building cohort through the Rollins Center. Um, we will be hosting a literacy conference this summer in partnership with the Rollins Center for kindergarten through fifth grade teachers to focus all around structured literacy. We're very excited about that. And our Office of Rural Education and Innovation has a literacy initiative that is in 15 of 16 RISAs. And the only reason it's not in that 16th RISA is because that RISA doesn't have any rural school systems. Um, and so we're excited about the work that the Office of Rural Education is doing. Um, many of you know that Georgia has new K through 12 English language arts standards. I've been on a grand tour of Georgia this week and last week to provide the first level of training for that. We'll implement these standards in the 25-26 school year. And one of the most important things is that there is a foundations domain. And I tell everybody that that foundations domain is really building the foundation, a strong foundation for this literacy house that we're trying to build. It's very focused on the bottom part of the reading rope for recognition. And I'm just certain that um, these new standards coupled with all 
that we, all the other things that we're doing is going to make a big difference for our students. And I think there's one more slide for me. These are, this is a slide that shows um, the Department of Education's legislative priorities. And I just wanted to focus on two that are directly affected, that are directly connected to literacy. Um, the first one is to support early literacy by adding funding for science of reading based coaching and professional learning. And we talked about that. The second one is to expand the return to work opportunity to include retired teachers who have a reading or a dyslexia endorsement and to consider this area a high need area throughout the state. Um, we need some of our retired teachers who have expertise in this area to return to work. And so we hope that that can happen this year um, through the legislative work that is happening at the Capitol. And I think, Jennifer, that that is me turning things over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a fabulous overview of all the um, amazing work that's already underway. Um, Amy and others on our team certainly hit the ground running um, quite literally right after the bill was passed. Um, whether we were ready or not, we we took off with um, trying to determine how best to align these different um, policies, practices. Um, so that document that Amy first shared, the Aligning Literacy Policies and Practices document is something that you really do need to, if you're a classroom teacher, administrator, um, keep it in, within arm's reach um, with you on a daily basis. And, and as Amy said, we do update that regularly. So um, I am really fortunate to work with her and others um, on the literacy team uh, with all these efforts. And as Joy and I think Amy both mentioned that we're actually kind of going in reverse order. Um, SB 48 was passed first in 2019 um, in the spring. And so we've done quite a bit of work um, already with, with the piloting, uh, the requirements of SB 48. And I will pause for just a moment to um, piggyback on, on the professional learning requirements that Amy mentioned, the different options, A, B, C, and D. And a lot of questions we um, receive pretty regularly from um, all different um, personnel in the schools, whether it's administrators or SLPs or special ed teachers or um, general education teachers, first grade teachers is, you know, which which um, option is best for me or administrators might say, do we need to choose the same option for all of our teachers? And that's not the intent of it. Um, I think that the the Georgia Literacy Academy is, is certainly a first um stop for many and most that that's where we can get the most as Amy already reported the numbers are quite um it's just really impressive how many are already um fully engaged in the Georgia Literacy Academy modules um, but I also would recommend for those of you who are yourselves EIP teachers or special ed teachers or administrators thinking about this and thinking about it in a tiered approach to that professional learning. So as we're increasing the need for student support, the training should also um, reflect that for your teachers. So be thinking about, a, you know, if, if you have a teacher who's an EIP teacher or special ed teacher who's not had any additional training beyond those modules, be thinking about dyslexia endorsement or one of the IDA approved programs to layer on top of that. Um, so that I'm gonna, that's my segue into the efforts already underway um, related to SB 48. Um, so just a real quick, as Amy sh um, shared her buckets, I should have stars around all of these. Um, but these are the, the key components or parts of SB 48, um, policies for identifying students with characteristics of dyslexia. And just to be clear, it's not a law that's intended um, for schools to be diagnosing or, or personnel in the schools to diagnose dyslexia, but to instead identify um, students with characteristics and provide that support um, and determine additional support that may be needed. Um, to create a dyslexia informational handbook, a professional development related to supporting students with characteristics of dyslexia, a teaching endorsement, pilot program, and then screening guidance. So um, I'm happy to say we have accomplished, I think we could put check marks next to all of those, and I'm going to go into more detail for each, um, each of those components now. So here's where we are, a quick snapshot 
um, where we've been, where we're going. Um, so we've have a lot of resources I'll be sharing with you. Um, that's the top uh, row there. And then on the bottom, we I'll talk more about this, but we are offering and have been offering monthly technical assistance chats. Um, we have our first 2024 one tomorrow from 12 to 1. We have a dyslexia task force that is has been integral in all of this work. We're updating the informational handbook, and then we're also creating uh, considerations for English learners with characteristics of dyslexia resource. Um, so I'm going to start with the dyslexia endorsement um, fairly soon after SB 48 was passed in 2019. Uh, there was a task force that worked with the PSC in creating a dyslexia rule. Um, so we now have 20 uh, approved programs and 16 of those have currently um, funds to support their teachers in the 2022-23 school year. Or, um, they, we also provided funding from Godot to support those programs. So this year, um, approximately 600 scholarships have already been awarded um, for those enrolled in the program. In the previous year, we were at 565. So um, the funds are, are being used to support the teachers. They can also be used to support instructors who want additional training. They can be used for materials um, and also re revamping courses within these um, programs. So they're at recess, private universities, and public um, universities. Um, oftentimes we'll get a question, um, both Amy and I, like, where should we be right now? Uh, all of these, um, these requirements uh, begin with uh, August of 2024 and, and after that. Um, so how do we know if we're ready? What, what should we be doing? Um, so this is a first place um, you want to go is to, to download this dyslexia planning and discussion guide. It's also relevant to HB 538 because it really focuses on, first on core instruction and you and your team, uh, whether you're a teacher, administrator, um, SLP, school psychologist, will want to you know sit down and look at these questions and help prioritize um, where you you need to, to kind of focus your efforts and your resources, um, and where you can pat yourselves um, on the back and say we're in pretty good shape here. Um, so you can download that, um, and then we also have a dyslexia task force I mentioned. Um, in the previous year, we had four working groups that were instrumental in helping to create guidance and resources um, to share with all of you. Um, but it is comprised, it's about 60 to 70 members, um, subject matter experts, education stakeholders. We have P-12 school representatives, colleges and universities, RISAs, professional associations, other state agencies. So if you're on the task force, thank you for your passion, commitment, and time. Um, like I said, we met four times last year, some face-to-face, -face, um, some virtually, and then we also had the working groups. And this year, um, it's really kind of this, I don't want to say gap year, but this time between creating all the, the supports and ongoing and responding to the needs of the state and then um, thinking about what needs to happen when the actual implementation takes place beginning in August of 2024. So I'll share a few things. Um, we learned a lot uh, from the pilot program, which was a three-year implementation program, a total of four years um, beyond that uh, total, um, the first year with it being planning year. Um, so I'll share what we learned. If you haven't seen or been on the Dyslexia website, I'll share with you how to get there. Um, but we have lots of great resources, including um, our final dyslexia pilot program year three, and it kind of summarizes all of the lessons learned, the challenges, the successes, and most importantly, um, recommendations for school districts who are not part of the pilot and who I've been hearing from lots of you who are not formally part of the um, pilot program, but you are doing your own informal um, rolling out. And thank you for doing that because I love hearing from you and the questions are getting um, much more detailed and much more micro level questions, which is a good sign. Um, but one of the questions I know that was submitted is, you know, how were thresholds or cut scores um, determined to deter in the decision making for students with characteristics of dyslexia? And that is a local decision. Um, most you'll read in this report that most of the pilot programs use the recommendations of whatever the publisher of the, the screener they were using. 
Um, but we want Amy and I both um, try to be intentional about cautioning and encouraging you all to not just base decisions on a single score. Um, you all probably know that, but you know, multiple sources of information and data, additional um, diagnostic or informal assessments, classroom observations, and so on. So when I hear um, you know districts or representatives from those districts say, "Well, the screener said." Um, that this student has dyslexia. Well, the screener doesn't say that. The screener might suggest that's the cutoff um, for a student to be thinking about that, but we provided additional rubric and, and other guidance to help make, uh, I think, more informed decisions beyond just that single score or data point. So for the dyslexia pilot program, there were a total of 134 schools across the three years that participated and impacted uh, more than 153,000 students. Um, some lessons learned um, from the seven pilot districts, and this is collective lesson, um, instruction and foundational reading skills is the root of many students' difficulties with reading. So we learned that very quickly in year one. We met at least monthly with um, the pilot district representatives, and they quickly realized we're not quite at any point to determine whether a student is even being considered for characteristics of dyslexia because we are not certain that the reading instruction was evidence based and that was, you know, that it's not a, a result or outcome of poor reading instruction versus true uh, characteristics of dyslexia. So, um, a result of that or impact was to, um, they created, there were efforts to identify and support students um, start with improved core reading. So, again, this all predated HB 538, um, but we are now fortunate to have that bill that, that allows the, those efforts um, and fully supports those efforts. Um, a second main lesson um, was that MTSS provides the necessary infrastructure to identify students. So early on, there were lots of questions. Is this a separate path and tracking of students? Are we having a separate identification category? And no, none of that is happening. It's all embedded within your current existing MTSS process. And the, the more structured and um, I think well-oiled, I like to say it's a well-oiled machine um, for your MTSS process it, that is in place, um, the more success you'll have in terms of embedding some of these other requirements. Also, um, another lesson was the schools need clear and consistent guidance and expectations um, support from the district. So. Uh, the, the pilot district reported the need to build the capacity for implementing SB 48, having teams. So that's that was really critical. If you were um, had the opportunity to attend one of our two part webinars last year that we offered in the spring of 2023, where we um, you heard directly from the pilot districts um, the second one, the main focus was on what that team looked like, who was part of it and how. Um, how they kind of walk through the process and, and determine their identifying their needs. Um, some successes overall, um, improved core reading instruction. So again, this really laid a really solid foundation for HB 538, especially for these pilot districts um, and other districts who had already started to um, see those shifting and make efforts to, to, to provide professional learning and support for their teachers. Um, improved ability to analyze and use student reading assessment data, a mindset shift um, collectively in, in schools and even in the district, and then increased and improved collaboration between staff in the schools. Continued challenges. Um, some are that were reported interpreting student data and using it to inform instruction, especially when they weren't sure which screener for um, some districts during the pilot uh, that three years they either changed screeners more than once and or kept adding screeners, but not taking any away. So at one point they may have been using, you know, four or five different screeners. And then there had all these data points that they really weren't understanding what to do with. So um, again, talking with them, meeting monthly and talking through some of these challenges was really beneficial. Um, providing reading intervention to all who need it. That is challenging, especially when you have schools that may have after an initial universal screener or the dyslexia screener, you know, 75% of the students were flagged. How do we, act, how do, what does that look like? How do we even begin? 
Um, so that's a real challenge that we're still hearing about um, and continue that we expect to hear, especially in these next um, one to two years. Um, and then identifying English learners with characteristics of dyslexia and that kind of interaction between um, the English learner and the actual reading um, weaknesses, and then getting buy-in from school and district leadership. Um, so some recommendations that you'll read in that report um, is to examine and strengthen your MTSS implementation, um, create a district team, carefully select your screening tool. And as Amy mentioned, the Deal Center has a fabulous um, report that is very helpful in helping to identify um, screeners based on how they were rated um, in that review that their team did. Um, look at closely at existing resources and core instruction to identify gaps and use that um, supplemental um, resource guide that Amy also mentioned we have um, to, to identify or select supplemental materials and then communicate with parents early and often. We heard um, across all districts that preemptively and transparency is so important when communicating with parents. So here's our process from day one. This is what you can expect um, that really helped, uh, again, preemptively um, minimize the number of requests. Uh, if a student, if they got information that their child maybe scored below the threshold on a screener, they weren't immediately saying, I want my child evaluated for special ed. So there's a process. Um, so real quickly, and then we'll turn it over um, for some questions. So some screening tools and guidance that are available. Um, this is the dyslexia board rule. Um, if you haven't seen that, it's not exactly um, aligned with SB 48. So we've gotten some questions about that. But in general, the board rule kind of trumps the, the um, SB 48, it's intended to provide additional, more specific guidance. Um, so that is the intent of a board rule in general. Um, the qualified screening tools can be found here. These were approved in May, and we also have funding for all districts to use this year, and needs the funds need to be spent by August, the end of August of 2024, to purchase a screener. Um, this is the funding I just mentioned. And then here's our screening guidance um, that, again, with the task force, the pilot districts and um, input from internally from colleagues, this walks you through what that process looks like in terms of screening, meeting the requirements of both HB 538 and SB 48. And then here's the dyslexia rubric that, um, so we're going to layer this onto the um, reading intervention plan that that more students would likely have um, once you get down to the and the flow chart of a student being identified with characteristics of dyslexia, then they would get an instructional plan specific to those um, characteristics that were identified. And so that will be kind of part two of that reading intervention plan for a much fewer percent of students or lower percent. And then here we also have created a dyslexia resource guide for Georgia families, and we also have that in Spanish. Um, and then I mentioned we are offering, we did it in the fall, but we're continuing through the spring every month on Thursdays from 12 to 1, the third Thursday of every month. You can hop on a chat and it's more open. It's not what we're doing tonight. It's more you can submit questions and talk openly. They're not recorded. We do share updates on resources, but it's really intended for open space um, for district representatives to, to join and ask questions and talk with one another. Um, we have to mention, um, we want to mention that IDA Georgia offers scholarship and grant opportunities for teachers. Um, so the grants are intended for instructors and faculty in programs that are either dyslexia endorsement programs, reading endorsement, or just teaching reading classes at RESAs or um, IATs, institutes of higher ed. And for faculty, we're encouraging um, they can have funds to seek or pursue additional training through IDA Georgia or IDA approved um, programs, just like option B um, for teachers. And then please do um, visit our dyslexia website. There's 
phenomenal videos. If you haven't seen some of the questions that were submitted, um, really the videos, they're 10 minutes. There's four of them. The fourth one is 20 minutes, but it one of the questions I saw was what's the difference between um, structured literacy and science of reading. And we break that down in video number four. Um, so take some time, look at all the resources on the website, and you can find a list also of in dyslexia endorsement programs and some other great resources. So that was a lot of information between what Joy shared and what um, Amy shared and then what I shared. So let's open it up to some, for some questions. I think um, our moderator and wonderful um, colleague Elizabeth will start with some that were submitted that we may um, maybe didn't address just now, and then we'll have a few minutes for any others that may have come in. Hey, yes. Thank you, Dr. Lindstrom. So um, we have a lot of questions. Um, I'm Elizabeth Hogan, the president of the Reading League Georgia chapter and a literacy leader and trainer for Reading is Essential for All People, which is a local um, Georgia structured literacy training um, nonprofit. Um, okay, so we heard a lot from Amy about um, the training that uh, teachers are going to get in K through three, but we had questions about what about those kids in fourth through 12th grade who are far below grade level, what are teachers in those areas going to receive as far as training or what supports are going to be in place for those kids? Elizabeth, that's a great question. And it's one of the questions that we, I think that Jennifer and I get the most. And so I do have some good news that there is some help on the horizon in a couple of different ways. We have a partnership, as I've mentioned earlier, with the Rollins Center. And this is one of the areas that they are working with us on. We're, we're exploring a plan for developing modules, especially for teachers in older grades, maybe four through 12, to assist them so that they know how to intervene when they get a, a student in those older grades who has significant gaps. Um, we also are working with our English language arts team at the department as part of our new standards work on um, adolescent literacy and how to intervene when we get these children with significant um, deficits. And so there is support coming. It's not ready just yet. Um, several states though have some things out there. Tennessee has done some work in this area and has some information that's freely available on their website. And as Joy mentioned earlier, we do try to work with our partners in other states to learn from what they are doing so that we can um, do a good job of following in their footsteps. Awesome. That's great news to hear. Um, and following kind of piggybacking on that, Dr. Lindstrom, are there dyslexia screeners that can also work for kids of that higher age? Um, can we use the same ones or will there be different ones that we could possibly use to identify those kids above third grade? That's a great question. Again, we get that frequently. So your first step would be to look at the screeners on the approved list and see, um, you know, in their uh, manual and just on their website, it'll say how some of the screeners do go way, well beyond um, third grade. Um, the bill itself is not written in that we will be vetting or looking at any screeners for those grades at this time. Um, but I would certainly reach out to the vendors, you know, if you have questions of any of those screeners. And also in the deal centers report, I believe it um, also addresses the grade levels, even if it is if they did extend beyond. Awesome. OK, um, I don't know who wants to take this question, but it's always asked. So I know you're ready. Money. Will there be additional funding from the state for these screeners, for the teacher training, for instructional materials um, that districts are going to need to purchase? Um, is that coming? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll take a <laughs> I'll take a leap of faith that just to say right. that there the governor put eleven point three million into his recommended budget FY twenty five for literacy coaches coaches and the de development of a free screener. Um, I have heard rumblings from legislators that you know want to help out in that way. We're only in day what five of the session, so we have a long way to go before we really know how that shapes out. 
And I'll piggyback on that. So that's encouraging. Thank you, Joy, um, for that firsthand um, knowledge that you just shared. And we do have, as I mentioned, um, funds for the screeners um, that districts can use through the end of August if they haven't used it yet. Um, we also have the funds for the dyslexia endorsement. Um, we have the teacher scholarships through IDA Georgia that can help um, not fully, fully cover. And then Amy, do you have anything else to add in terms of funds? Um, so as far as professional learning goes, I mentioned earlier the Office of Rural Education and Innovation. They have invested a lot of ESSER funds into these contracts with the 15 RESAs that I mentioned and are making a large dent in being able to provide high quality training that's accredited by the International Dyslexia Association to um, teachers throughout our rural school districts. And so there are some pockets of things that are happening um, to help with funding of all of these initiatives. Nice. That's good to hear. Thank you all. Um, we, especially those of us who work in structured literacy, are really excited about um, Georgia's literacy coaching model. So people definitely asked a lot of questions about that. Um, you did cover it, Amy, but if there's any more insight, um, will all the trainings be asynchronous or are we expecting teachers to have support on the ground in their school, um, coaching them along the way with the trainings? Yes, and so the proposed um, coaching model does not at this time include a literacy coach in every school. Obviously, that would probably be the ideal, but we know that we already have many literacy coaches in our schools and many instructional coaches, and we want to be sure that we're leveraging the folks who are already there. This tiered coaching plan at its core is really focused on 32 regional coaches that can help to leverage the things that are already in place and to fill those gaps where there are gaps. We wanna be sure that we um, are smart about the way we implement a coaching model in Georgia. I've had the pleasure of talking to our partners in neighboring states who have already done this, and I think it's important for us to learn from them. And so we want to start out making sure that those regional coaches are very well trained, that they are ready to be deployed out to systems and to schools, and we really want to situate them to become coaches of coaches. We know that 32 regional coaches can't possibly serve the 1,300 elementary schools in Georgia that serve students in grades K through three. But we do believe with a really tight and structured framework that they can. it can be a good beginning and that we can really learn a lot of great lessons about how to leverage things that are already out there and available because everybody wants to be part of this good work that's gonna help to transform literacy in Georgia. That's really exciting. I saw today that Superintendent Woods announced um, that Dr. Philman yes, is going yes. to be leading the work with this from Marietta City Schools. So it is it is certainly a high priority. Um, so we are really thrilled to, that he'll be kind of leading the way uh, with those efforts. Yes. yes. I know he's on the call tonight. So well, yes. congratulations. Yes. And we're so excited. Um, Nick and I, I work we, won't, we won't ask you to here. speak and tell us your big master plan right now, but just wait, we're, we're going to invite you soon to do that. Okay. Yes. We were very excited to see that announcement today. Okay. Lastly, I think maybe we have quite, um, time for one more and Joy, you covered this a bit and I learned something um, because we know the new legislation around structured literacy and early literacy um, is calling for um, teachers to be trained. So our colleges and our universities to be preparing our pre-service teachers to walk right into um, our schools and already know, be trained and ready to do the work in structured literacy. Um, I kind of learned tonight for the first time that that is going to mainly come from the PSC, it sounds like. Um, so is there any more detail you can give around that? We had a lot of pre-service yeah. teachers write in with some questions about how can I be prepared? That, that's awesome. And to me, this is, again, to, to use Amy's phrase, the perfect storm. We're training assisting teachers. We're training uh, pre-service. And so we'll have a cadre of trained teachers in structured 
literacy. So um, before House Bill 538 came along, Chancellor Purdue put together um, or assembled a task force to develop standards for the university system of Georgia and the schools of ed in uh, science of reading instruction. And um, he says over you know, over the time he's been in office, he's, he has said many times, you know, we've got to have our new teachers knowing how to instruct our students. And so from that, the Georgia Professional Standards Commission has developed a rule and that has been published on their website. Um, they're now in the process of developing um, for our GACE and help me with the acronym educators. Um, George, um, Georgia assessment for certified educators. Thank you, Amy. Perfect. <laughs> that was a great <laughs> I had that to was think a test. hard. <laughs> So beginning July 1, 2025, every new teacher will need to pass that portion of our GACE certification test. And so there, you know, we've got some really amazing guardrails in place for all of our educators. And so we're really excited about that. That's awesome. And I love that so many pre-service pre teachers wrote in and are interested and it's already you know, at the front of their mind and they're ready to jump in and do this work in Georgia, which is amazing. We need to keep our teachers here. I would encourage all of you who are here or listening later as you're walking or driving or wherever you're listening um, and watching the recording is to, if you're enrolled in a pre-service um, program, to ask your, you know, your instructors of the reading courses, you, can you embed those um, Georgia Literacy Academy modules within that course? Because those are what your future colleagues will have also most likely, many of them, um, gone through. So there's there's nothing to prohibit or prevent you from doing that on your own um, and or within your program. So as a, a also wearing a different hat, you know, at UGA, I was um, oversee helping to oversee the dyslexia program there. And we need to hear from you in those requests um, directly to your professors, to your instructors saying, hey, and that's the other reason we're also trying to promote um, faculty to take advantage of our grant opportunity through IDA so they can go seek letters training or AIM or Orton Gillingham or any of those IDA approved um, programs so they can also supplement their training um, and help teach you all, the pre-service teachers, um, to be better aligned with um, what our, where the direction our state is heading in. So don't be shy. I ask your, your instructors about it. And that's a good just, yeah. just quickly, um, pre-service teachers, you can access those modules at coxcampus.org. It is the K through third structured literacy suite. And you'll have, um, again, a copy of this and of one of the slides has the, the guide to how to access those. So we have it all there for you. You can start tonight. You can just do that and for your nightly um, right before bed, get started on that first module. Yes, I'm sure that is exactly what they're going to do right after that. I'm sure, right. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and end fairly on time. We just went a couple of minutes early, but I wanted to thank you so much to our speakers tonight. I learned a lot and um, I know everyone here learned a lot. And thank you to all of those attending. Um, we've learned so much about the literacy legislation and how this policy already is and will continue to impact literacy instruction across Georgia. Um, if you do have colleagues who missed tonight's live webinar, let them know that everyone who registered will be receiving a link to the video of the webinar and to the presenter's slides from the presentation. So they didn't have to be here live. Um, also, and I saw a couple of questions about this in the chat, all residents, including those that were on the wait list, will also have an opportunity to fill out a knowledge check request for a COA form after you have viewed the webinar here tonight live or the recorded version. Um, and that form will be sent to all registrants next week, and you'll have a, approximately one week to submit the form. And those who fill out the form will receive their COA the day after the deadline for submission. All right. On Please the register for the subsequent um, sessions. We have the next one on February 7th. Um, Kamiana Burke from Mississippi will be joining us so we can hear all about their efforts and what we can learn from them. So you can go ahead and register um, on the website. And there's two more after that as well in March and in April, I believe. Yeah. 
It's an amazing series. And um, on the behalf of the boards of IDA Georgia and the Reading League Georgia, we appreciate you for attending this evening. We hope you have a rest, a beautiful night. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, um, February 7th. Um, with Dr. Burke, who will talk about lessons learned from Mississippi and then in our subsequent two webinars. So it's an amazing series and we hope you'll join us for all four. Um, so thanks for being here and we'll see you in February. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, y'all. Good night. Thank you.